Okay, so today we're moving on to a new topic. We're going to look at the role of ideas and information, or new ideas, on the economy. So we've been looking at asymmetric information. This is sort of looking at an alternative view of it in the creation of new ideas, the creation of new products, the creation of innovation, and the impact it has on economic performance. So from our perspective, ideas improve the technology of production. So the factors of production are available, like land, labor, raw materials, they're all there. What differs is how you combine them, what you get them to do. The basic factors are all in place and have probably been in place since the creation of the planet. We've got nothing new since the planet was created four and a half billion years ago. But what has happened is we're changing how we actually use them. And this has been particularly so in the last 150, 200 years that man has been sort of around for, in present form, maybe for eight, 10,000 years. But for most of those, economic growth, economic progress was negligible. Living standards in the year 500 AD were largely the same as they were in the year 1500. <clears throat> but now living standards are changing quite rapidly. The year 2011 is substantially different to the year 1961, just 50 years ago. So a span of a thousand years having little change, and now things change almost by the year. So technology is the way inputs to a production process are transformed into output. <clears throat> so much of the inputs are largely the same. What is differing is how we actually combine them. So a new idea allows a given bundle of inputs to produce more or better output. <clears throat> and in the economics of growth and development, ideas and technology have very important roles. And one sort of school of thought in the economics of growth is that economic, is economic growth is largely the result of the emergence of the creation of ideas, the fostering of innovation, that that has allowed economic growth to take place, that given that the raw materials were all largely in place, it's in information, ideas, and innovation that things have changed. So the relationship between the economics of, of ideas and economic growth is along this line. So we'll work through four, uh, four of them. So we have ideas which in themselves are non-rivalrous, which we'll explain. And ideas which are non-rivalrous lead to increasing returns to scale. And then we'll also need imperfect competition. This is probably the one area, or one of the areas in economics, where we don't argue in favor of perfect competition. Most moves are in favor of perfect competition. That that leads to the most efficient outcome. That welfare is maximized under perfect competition with no barriers to trade, freedom of entry and exit, and perfect information. When it comes to the creation of ideas, imperfect competition is targeted, be that a monopoly or an oligopoly. That in some way there are barriers to entry and there isn't. Uh, perfect competition. So we'll work through these four, or well, three key concepts of non-rivalrous, increasing returns, and the necessity for perfect competition. First of all, ideas are non-rivalrous. That simply means they can be used up, or used, excuse me, used over and over again without being worn out. So once an idea has been created, anyone with knowledge of the idea can take advantage of it. And that's simply borne out by the phrase, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. Once the wheel has been invented, that's it, the idea is there. The idea can be used over and over again. One person figuring out a useful way of doing something and using that information doesn't stop anybody else from using it. It's not like most consumer goods, where consumers are rivals. So for something as simple as an apple, an apple is a rivalrous good. One person using and consuming the apple prevents somebody else from doing so. So one apple can have one consumer. One idea can have an infinite number of users. Simply can be used over and over and replicated over and over again without ever being worn out. So ideas are non-rivalrous. This in itself is a use, but it also has disadvantages. <laughs> Another important characteristic of, of goods is excludability. This is the degree to which a good is excludable, is the degree to which the owner can charge a fee for its use. Can you stop people from using the good? 
if you can't stop people, they'll just simply use it without pain. So a simple concept of excludability is in relation to TV signals. The RTE TV signal is uh, non-excludable. They can't stop anybody from using it. A person with a television and a wire uh, coat hanger can tune into RTE. So are people going to pay for that product? The broadcast single signal from B Sky B is excludable. You have to have a box and a decoder card. In order to be able to tune into it. <clears throat> so there's differences in the degree in which they can be used. <clears throat> Both of those products are non rivalrous. One person tuning into RTE doesn't stop somebody else tuning into it. The signal can be tuned into 10, 100, a million, 100 million times. The same with the broadcast signal of B Sky B. <clears throat> but look at the difference the way the owner can charge a fee for its use. RTE requires legislation and a levy in order to collect money. The TV license, far easier for B, Sky B. They have no government mandate to collect money off consumers, but because the signal is excludable, is broadcast in a scramble manner and needs a decoder, they have greater ease of collecting a fee for it. So they can prevent somebody from using it. So if you can't prevent somebody from using it, it's very hard to charge a price. So the person who invented the wheel probably didn't make too much money from it. As soon as one person saw it, another person could copy it, could be copied again, and the idea became widespread. So one issue with ideas is if they're non-excludable, then well, where's the incentive to create them? There's an incentive for B Sky B to create broadcast television. They can charge for it. Public sector broadcasting, such as RTE, needs a TV license. And even then, the TV license isn't perfect. How much is it? So no one in the room watches RT, or no one in the room has a television. If you have a television, you must have a television license. <coughs> That's what the ad says. <coughs> Whereas I'm sure how much is Sky Sports for a month? Which is that? Any idea? I have no idea either. But. Very easy for them to charge. So the concepts of rivalry and not excludability are important. <clears throat> if the good is rivalrous, consumers must get it each time they use it. So here you have the ability to, to charge separate consumers. If the good is excludable, you can stop them from using it. So for rivalrous, excludable goods, it's easy to charge money. The unit is consumed by a person, and you can stop them using it. So for apples, it's easy to charge money. The owner has the apple, owns it, gives it to a consumer. Only one consumer can then eat that apple. If somebody else wants it, they must come and get a different one. And if the original consumer has consumed the first apple, they must come back for a second one. So clearly, it's far easier to charge. If a good is non-rivalrous and non-excludable, if you give it to one person, that person can use it over and over again. If you give it to one person, it can be transferred to other people, and they can use it over and over again. So whereas on an apple, you can charge a price for each and every unit you sell. For an idea, as soon as it gets out there, you might only be able to charge once. If it's non-rivalrous and non-excludable, you don't have to invent the, reinvent the wheel. So goods that suffer from the tragedy of commons problem are rivalrous, but have a low level of excludability. <laughs> so you have goods such as international fishing waters. So here you have a product where the fishermen are rivals. One trawler taking a shoal of fish out of the water prevents somebody else from doing so. So there is a degree of rivalry. <laughs> but there also is non-excludability. Fish are free to roam wherever they wish in the seven seas. So you don't have the boundaries like you would have on land. So fishing stocks are com completely different to cattle stocks. Even though we consume huge amounts of beef, there are very few arguments that we're about to run out of cattle. We probably consume a fewer quantity of fish, yet there's continual arguments about fish stocks. The problem is the degree of excludability. People can't be prevented from taking out particular fish. 
There are various rules put in place, but they've largely failed, particularly in international waters, where these rules may, may not apply. And of course, countries have the incentive to cheat on the rules. So you have European rules and quotas, you have global rules on particular quotas, but of course, each country wants to look after itself. If every country is breaking the agreement, why should one country leave the fish in the water if somebody else is going to take them out? Fish I leave in the water today are fish somebody else is going to take out tomorrow. And because the good is rivalrous, as soon as it's taken out, I can't do so. <clears throat> so the tragedy of the commons suffer from overuse. The internet is a tragedy of the commons. The internet has uh, low excludability. And because of the level of use, it does have rivalrous um, issues. So you might say that surely the internet is non-rivalrous. Well, the degree of broadband, uh, bandwidth, and the size of storage space clearly have some limits. So email and spam is a good that suffers from the tragedy of the commons. We'd all be better off if no spam was forwarded. But of course, if nobody is forwarding spam, it's in your interest to do so. If people are ignoring messages, they won't read them. But if the level of messages declines, they start reading them all. But then it's in your interest to send your spam. And of course, if it's in one person's interest, it's in everybody's interest. And the level increases again. So the tragedy of the commons is a fairly uh, frequent occurrence where goods are overused. And it primarily has to do with property rights. If property rights are defined, the tragedy of the commons won't emerge. But where property rights are undefined, common ground, common fishing rights, common bandwidth, it will tend to be abused and overused. So ideas are non-rivalrous. They can be used over and over again, but vary substantially in the degree of excludability. Can you stop people using your idea? Can you stop people using the innovation? Or if, as soon as it's created and put out there, is it widely available for everybody? So goods that are excludable allow their producers to capture the benefits they produce. If you can stop somebody from using it, and there's a benefit to using it, they're willing to pay to get that benefit. But only if you can stop them from using it. So goods with spillovers of benefits that are not captured by producers tend to be underproduced. If the good offers benefits to the community, benefits to society, but the producer can't capture that in a price, well, the incentive to produce it is reduced. A good can create a certain amount of benefit, but unless you can capture it in a price and convert that into profit, the market won't provide it. So ideas are perhaps one area where there may be underproduction. Is it in an individual's, is it in a firm's interest to produce and generate an idea? There's clearly huge benefits for society. There could be huge spillover benefits. One idea could lead to another. But is the incentive there to create the idea in the first place unless you can capture some of the benefits? So goods that are rivalrous must be produced each time they are sold. Goods that are non-rivalrous need to be produced only once. So all you have to do is create the idea once. So non-rivalrous ideas involve a fixed cost of production and a zero marginal cost. So the fixed cost is creating the idea in the first place. A certain amount of investment, a certain amount of time, a certain amount of labour required to create the idea, whatever it might be. A new pharmaceutical, a new innovation, a new method of production, a new phone, <coughs> a new way of um, organising production, whatever it might be, has a fixed cost, an upfront cost. And then once you have the idea created, you can use it over and over again. You'll never wear it out and never use it up. So once a product is developed, so given the location we're in, we consider a new pharmaceutical, each additional unit is produced with constant returns to scale. So doubling inputs will double production. If you know what to put into the pill, into the tablet, and if you double the inputs, you'll double the output. Have the machines running for twice as long, and you produce twice as much output. That is once the idea is created. So the production process has a fixed cost. Get the idea in the first place, and then a constant marginal cost. Produce the tablet. So the fixed cost could run to uh, hundreds of millions, and the marginal cost might only be a few cents. How much does it cost to make a particular tablet once you know what goes into it? The vast majority of tablets are just filler. 
the active ingredients are quite a small proportion of the tablet and the cost can be quite low. So the production process has zero output produced until the idea is created. Then once you have the first unit produced, you can basically go on and replicate that as often as you wish. So the ideas, or sorry, the economics of ideas is linked to the presence of increasing returns to scale. So why is there increasing returns to scale? Well, on the vertical axis, we have output, the quantity produced, number of tablets. On the horizontal axis, we have input. You can measure this in labor, capital, money, whatever it might be. The amount that goes into producing a particular product. <coughs> Up to a fixed cost, F, no output is produced. We'll just move F a little to the left. Oops, I may have been editing. So up to the fixed cost, F, no output is produced. So F should be just where that is. So until you have the fully fixed cost invested, you're not producing anything. Here you're involved in experiments, involved in research, involved in R&D, perhaps involved in trialing and testing, whatever it might be, until you get to the first unit. So there could be huge investment to get to the first unit, to create the first unit produced. And for a new pharmaceutical, that could be hundreds of millions of dollars. The R&D generally doesn't take place in Ireland. We tend to take over as soon as the product is created. <coughs> and of course, a successful product must also pay for all the failures. And so the level of investment to get one unit out onto the market could be huge. <coughs> but once you've paid the fixed cost, I know what to do. Well, then output increases with constant returns to scale. Double outputs, you du double, sorry, double inputs, you double output. Double inputs again, you double output. It increases at a constant rate. <coughs> so, what does this mean about the, uh, hence the economics of ideas and increase in returns to scale? So, F units are required to produce the first unit. So, thus, F is the large research cost as fixed. The increase in returns to scale can be seen that average product is rising with the scale of production. Average product is output divided by input. What is the average output for every unit of input? So it's output divided by input. So if you look at this line here, the slope of a line is the rise over the run. You take the lower line here, starts at the origin and goes to this point in the production function. The rise is the level of output. What is the run? And it starts at the origin and goes out as far as this point here. That is the amount of input. So this represents a point in the production function, this point here. And the slope of this line represents average product. The rise divided by the run. As you increase output, as you go up along the production function, you will see that the slope of the line has to increase. We just have two points marked out here. If we had a further point up here, the slope would be larger again. So as you increase output along this production function, average product increases. There are increasing returns to scale. Average product is increasing. <clears throat> so why is this? Well, one issue is, of course, the costs. Because you must incur a huge fixed cost to get to one unit, <clears throat> after that, then, you're spreading that fixed cost out over many more units. So a common question about pricing in markets for medicine, for pharmaceuticals, for software, <clears throat> which basically has a free margin, a zero marginal product, and music, is if the marginal cost of production of some products is so small, why does the product cost so much? So last week we were looking at the treatment of an irregular heartbeat. And they were given a price of maybe 30, 40 euro per tablet. You can be pretty sure that the cost of making that tablet is only a fraction of that price. That as soon as you have the tablet created, you can make it relatively cheaply. So in this instance, why is the market so inefficient? 
And inefficiency is where price is above marginal cost. In a market that's perfectly competitive, price will equal marginal cost. What the firm will get is a normal rate of return for producing the product. But why in markets for medicine, software, music, and other areas is the difference between price and marginal cost so large? Why does the cost of producing each extra unit stay so low while the price is so high? So efficiency requires that price equals marginal cost. However, the inefficiency is in many ways a necessary one, and it's perhaps an area where economists won't argue for perfect competition. With the price being so high and so high above marginal cost, it prevents some people from using it. The market doesn't generate the full amount of welfare, and we clearly saw that or listened to that with the extract from uh, Liveline that there was people out there who wanted to use the product, would have been willing to pay the true marginal cost, but because the firm was a monopoly, they could charge a price far in excess of marginal cost. They were earning a profit, they were earning a super normal profit, but consumers of the product were losing out because they weren't getting to use it. So why is this inefficiency a necessary one? Why did no one come on the show and start berating the pharmaceutical companies? Why can they get away with charging 40 euro for something that might cost a fraction of a cent? It's because with a fixed cost and increasing returns to scale, setting price equal to marginal cost will result in negative profits. So if price equals marginal cost, there will be negative product profits. The reason being that if price equals marginal cost, the firm couldn't cover the initial fixed cost the firm wouldn't be able to cover the cost of investment. It would cover its cost of production, but would never cover its cost of research. So while the company might be making the thing for a couple of cent, by charging 40 euros per tablet, it's not necessarily making 39 euros 90 profit per tablet. It might have a four or 500 million research bill to cover before it even starts earning a profit. So the 40 euro would quickly be consumed by that. And if the market was competitive, what would happen is that the firm would never make a profit. So the first unit cost F to produce. So the average cost of the first unit is massive. Getting the first pill out there costs hundreds of millions. Um, so at higher levels of output, the fixed cost is spread over more and more units. So as you produce more and more, the four or 500 million you spent on research gets spread out over more units. So the average cost begins to decline. So if you make 10 million units and it's cost you 400 million to produce the first unit, the average cost or the average research cost per unit is now 40 euro. The 400 million is spread over 10 million units. So the first unit had a huge average cost. It had to carry the entire production or research cost. But as you produce more and more, as you move out along the vertical axis, as output increases, average cost declines. Once you've the first unit produced, the marginal cost is constant. How can I make an extra unit? Put in extra inputs, put in extra raw materials, have the machine running for longer. The marginal cost is constant and it's quite low. It's a bit uh, exaggerated here, but the marginal cost is likely to be only a fraction of a cent. The issue is that with increasing returns to scale, average cost is always greater than marginal cost. <coughs> average cost includes the cost of production and the research costs. Marginal cost just includes the cost of production. How much does it cost to make the next unit? You don't have to reinvent the wheel. Once you have the product out there, the marginal cost is just how, mu how much does it cost to make more of it. When it comes to the average cost, clearly that includes the cost of production, how much does it cost to make more, but it also includes the fixed cost at the start. The average cost includes getting the thing up and running in the first place. So while average cost will decline as you produce more, it will never fall below marginal cost. 
In fact, it will never touch it. Those lines will get closer and closer, but they'll never touch. If the market was competitive, if price equals marginal cost, so if the price was set equal to this level here, marginal cost, price would always be lower than average cost. Average revenue would be lower than average cost, and the firm would be making a loss if price was set equal to marginal cost, if the price was where that line is there. Because although the firm could cover its costs of production, it could never cover the research costs. And recall, in economics, costs include a normal rate of return. Like, what is the cost of using the capital in a particular venture? Marginal costs and average costs, and all economic costs, include a normal rate of return. So it's not that if price equals marginal cost in a normal market, you're not saying they earn no profit. They're earning the next best alternative. They're earning what they could earn if they produced elsewhere. But in a market with, in with a fixed cost of production of an idea and increasing returns to scale, if price equals marginal cost, the firm will never make a profit. So no firm would enter the market and pay the fixed cost to develop the new drug if it could not set price above the marginal cost of producing additional units. So if you are going to invent the new medicine, and that costs 400 million, but then as soon as you issued the product, you could only sell it for the cost of production, five or 10 cents, you're never going to get your 400 million back. It's impossible. The profit simply isn't there. If you're going to recoup the initial investment cost, you must be allowed to charge a price above marginal cost. In order to charge price above marginal cost, you must have market power. If you were charging a price above marginal cost, you didn't have market power, a rival would just step in. You were earning an excess rate of return. Somebody will just step in and try to capture that for themselves by underselling you. But if you have market power, you can stop somebody selling it you can set the price above marginal cost. So in practice, this is what we see. Medicine sells for very high prices when the marginal cost is only a few cents. There seems to be a huge remove between the cost of production and the retail price. And of course, the issue is that the cost of production aren't the key or sole costs. There is the initial cost at the start. So firms will only enter if they can charge a price higher than marginal cost that allows them to recoup the fixed cost of creating the good in the first place. And remember, for pharmaceutical companies, the winner not only has to pay for itself, but it also has to pay for all the losers. All those compounds, all those products that go to trial, all those products that aren't approved, they all incur costs for the firm, and nothing comes back in. So it might cost them a certain amount to produce the successful product, but in order to earn an overall rate of return, they must also cover the cost of all the failures. So depending on their product pipeline and their hit rate, they could have a lot of failures to cover, and depending on how far they go through the research product. <laughs> so the production of new goods or new ideas requires the possibility of earning profits, and here we're talking about supernormal profits, profits above the normal rate of return. Every competitive market has a normal profit. This is built into the costs. When we say price equals marginal cost, we're not saying the firms are, in a sense, breaking even in an accounting sense. They're earning the opportunity cost. So in order to allow the firms to charge above marginal cost, we need to move away from perfect competition. A perfectly competitive market is not one that allows the production of new goods or new ideas. In perfect competition, price equals marginal cost. If price equals marginal cost, no firm will spend 400 million getting a new product out there. So how do we prevent or limit competition in these markets? Well, what has been devised and designed over a couple of hundred years has been a system of intellectual property rights. Property rights have generally largely been well understood for most of history the concept of ownership, but in general, ownership related to physical goods. 
ownership of livestock, ownership of land, ownership of buildings. The ownership could be established and it was a physical product. It was tangible. Over time, property rights have moved into intangibles. The concept of ideas, something you can't see, something you can't touch, something that's not physical. And it really is one theory that the move of property rights into the intellectual, into ideas, is what has sparked a, a huge surge in economic growth over the last two or three hundred years, and particularly in the last 40 or 50 years, maybe even then in the last 20 years. But for most of our history, life didn't really change. Now there are new products, new innovations, new goods coming out on a daily, weekly basis. Can we even imagine what life will be like in five, ten years' time? How quickly can things change? Five years' time, or five years ago, perhaps slightly longer, everybody had a Nokia phone. Now we hardly know what one looks like. Who would have, who would have said before that bubble burst what was going to happen in that period? Who would have said five years ago that something you put into your pocket is more powerful than the computer that's set on a desk? So how quickly can things change has accelerated rapidly uh, and primarily for being able to capture the ideas, to create products that, are, uh, that you put out into the market but can't be copied. And this is where the incentive to innovate comes. Why are people great innovators? Why do we have the likes of the late Steve Jobs, the likes of um, Bill Gates, the likes of other people who set up companies from scratch and have turned them into global behemoths? <clears throat> Were people three, four, five hundred years ago incapable of it? Are we now smarter than people five hundred years ago? Unlikely, there might be some slow evolution taking place, but probably not in the basis of intelligence. Like surely, on average, our, there was people of high intelligence four or five years ago. Do we have anybody now comparable to Leonardo da Vinci? You might say Steve Jobs is a visionary in one particular area. Leonardo da Vinci was a visionary across many different areas. His notebooks contain things that didn't come into reality for three, four hundred years after his death. Why wasn't there more Leonardo da Vinci's? Why was there just one? Why now do we have a huge number of people involved in innovation and production, changing life by the day, the week, and the month? <clears throat> so one theory is it comes down to patents, copyrights, and we'll also add trademarks as we go through it. But when it comes to goods, you're dealing with patents and copyrights. Patents has to do with um, ideas, copyright has to do with authorship. Writing something, you get copyright. If you create an idea, you get a patent. If you write something, write a book, write music, write software, you get the copyright. So patents and copyrights are legal mechanisms that grant inventors monopoly power for a time in order to allow them to reap a return from their inventions. So patents and copyrights make ideas excludable. It's basically a legal ownership right so you own a car, you have the right to do with that car as you see fit. You have the property rights. If you want to use it, you can use it. If you want to lend it, you can lend it. If you want to sell it, you can sell it. But only you can do that. With ideas, unless there's some form of property rights, you can't do that. Once you create the idea, somebody else is free to use it. Once you create the idea, somebody else is free to sell it. Once you create the idea, somebody else is free to lend it. So what intellectual property rights do is give you the ownership. You are the only person that can do, use that idea. You can choose to do it or what you want. You can leave it on the shelf and ignore it. You can license it and let somebody else use it. You could sell it to a company. Or you could just live it out all out and let everybody else use it. But you have the sole authority to do that. You own the idea. It's not a physical good. It's an intangible. But you have the ownership of it. And you have a legal mechanism through which you can protect your ownership. <clears throat> so one of the important facts about economic growth is that it's a fairly recent phenomenon. Last couple of hundred years and we've been around for the guts of 10,000, maybe even longer if you go back through uh, earlier forms. And several schools of thought attribute its beginning to the development of intellectual property rights. That once intellectual property rights kicked off, people now saw the incentive to innovate. There might have been lots of Leonardo da Vinci's out there. 
But their priority was getting food on the table, sitting down, thinking, filling notebooks full of ideas, wasn't going to get money for most people. They couldn't put food on the table. <coughs> Leonardo da Vinci was able to do it because he was sponsored. The golden age of sort of that era in the Renaissance, <laughs> the creation of great works of art, wasn't because people sat down and said, I want to be an artist. It was because people like the de Medici, people like the Vatican, were sponsoring these people to produce it. There was money in it. That was the incentive. They were paid to do it. So Leonardo was sponsored. Leonardo da Vinci was sponsored by <coughs> different families, largely the Medici, and he could spend his time doing as he wished. And every so often they might require him to produce a piece of art, <coughs> paint a, a fresco on a wall, <coughs> and we're still looking at it four or five hundred years later. And the same with Michelangelo. We need the ceiling painted, Michelangelo. How long will it take you? About three years. Jeez, it's only the ceiling. But <coughs> Again, 400 years later, we're still looking at it. So it's not until individuals are encouraged by credible promise of large returns via the marketplace that sustained innovation occurs. Why are the likes of Bill Gates going into bedrooms and college dormitories writing software? <coughs> It's software. <laughs> Put your floppy in. <clears throat> Why is the likes of Steve Jobs, again in college, fiddling around with computers? What are they trying to do? Is it because they're interested in it, but also it's because they see a potential? <clears throat> Lots of things happen in college bedrooms. <clears throat> Facebook, I suppose, is another idea that emerged <clears throat> from a fairly low-scale, small-level investment and is now a company worth 50 billion. I'm not quite sure how it's actually worth 50 billion, but that tends to be the price putting it. <clears throat> so many believe that the incentive to innovate, the reason why we don't have more, or didn't have more Leonardo da Vinci's, is because the incentive to innovate wasn't there. People need to put food on the table. Sitting down thinking about ideas doesn't put food on the table. So whatever work was available at the time, that's where their efforts were directed. Now, because of intellectual property rights, you have the potential to capture the benefits. You get ownership of it. And of course, it does lead to uh, cases where people try to claim ownership of the idea. Who came up with it first? Was it Daft Looking Twins, the Winkelwassers, or the other fella? Well, who actually patented it. What's his name? What's his name? Zuckerberg, funny names, Mark Zuckerberg. <clears throat> so who creates the idea? Who actually comes up with the idea? Who can capture the benefits? So patent law began in Britain with the statute of monopolies in 1624. Patent law didn't begin to foster innovation. Patent law didn't begin to offer the incentive for intellectual property rights. What patent law began in 1624 was to grant royal charters to grant people monopoly power, to be the royal producer of a particular something, to have a stamp of a seal and be able to get monopoly power. It was about a system of creating a situation where uh, certain people had conferred on them particular rights, particular benefits. And I suppose 400 years later, things haven't changed too much. But it was set up to it, grant people monopoly power and allow them somewhere where they could protect it that if they were the royal producer of a particular product and somebody else tried to make it, somebody else tried to eat into their market, they could go somewhere to claim their property rights. They had legal redress to go somewhere. So it was sort of created in a very, not a very benign situation. It was actually created to allow firms to earn excess profits. Those who were viewed as being sort of uh, maybe loyal to the throne, loyal to the leader, or had sponsored particular things, <coughs> were granted these rights. <coughs> so it started off to produce particular areas, but it did set up the legal institutions that allowed property rights to be protected. If you were to be the sole producer of a particular product, where did you, t where did you go to? Well, you went to the court. What did you use? You used the statute of monopolies. However, initially, they weren't sufficiently developed to provide financial incentives for private investment in new ideas. In general, the monopoly power had to be granted by the ruling monarch, and then you could go and, and protect it. 
A person themselves couldn't go and get their own monopoly rights. You couldn't go and say, I am the sole producer of something. I'm here to protect my rights. The right came from the top. So even though there were large social returns from invention, it often required government-sponsored competitions or ideas for ideas to be generated and provide a private return and incentives to innovators. So Leonardo da Vinci was sponsored. So there was huge gaps in technology. Around the 16, 15, 16, 1700s, one of the huge gaps was in navigation. How can we get around the planet? When a ship is out on the seven seas, how do they know where they are? Clearly now it's very easy to know where we can pinpoint location to within inches with GPS, the global positioning system. Back four or five hundred years ago, they didn't have that. All they had out in the seven seas was the sun and the stars. They had no communication and no way of telling where they were. They knew where east and west was, and they could look up, and the stars would again tell them where east and west was. But they had no concept of how far north and south they were. Couldn't work out and hadn't, couldn't get exact positions. They knew where they were in one direction, but didn't know where they were in the other. And it was pretty easy for ships to get lost. Columbus thought he'd found India, a couple of thousand miles from India. <clears throat> ships thought that if it sailed in a particular direction, you'd reach a particular location. They'd end up hundreds, thousands of miles off course. They simply didn't have the ability to tell where they were going. They could point themselves in a direction and hope they ended up in that direction. But with storms, with winds blown off course, they could end up anywhere and had no way of pinpointing their location. <clears throat> so clearly there was a gap. So why wasn't somebody in a college bedroom trying to figure out how can ships find their way at sea? There was no incentive to do so. You could spend weeks, months, years at it, create the idea, everybody would use it, everybody would be delighted, but you'd be boiling stones for soup. So the issue was, how can we get this uh, redressed? So the government offered a prize. If you come up with the idea that allows us to solve this problem, we'll pay you money. So it could have been three, four, five thousand pounds. Doesn't sound much now, but back then it would have been huge amounts of money. Another area where a prize was offered was in uh, land transport. Particularly in the UK, once the Industrial Revolution occurred, moving coal from coal mines to factories became very important. And back in the 1700s, 1800s, Britain built a huge canal system. But it wasn't very efficient and required huge investment. And then the canal, the product moved quite slowly. They wanted a way of moving coal over land. So you could move it with a horse, but clearly you're limiting the amount that can be carried and again the speed. So there was some concept that if we can get some sort of engine to pull a set of trolleys, that you can move coal quite efficiently. But again, who was going to sit down and devise an engine that would allow coal to be moved? So again, the government stepped in and offered a prize and said on a particular day, there's a competition, bring your entry. Whichever entry is the best will win a prize. Now people have the incentive to go off into their garage, go off into their bedroom, and think up of ideas, because there's money at the end of it. We can put food at the table. And Stevenson's rocket was largely the result of one of those competitions. The first effective steam engine came out because of a competition. <clears throat> the sextant turned out to be the invention that allowed ships to measure where they were in a north-south direction. And that was also the result of a competition. But these tend to be fairly sporadic and not very complete. The only thing that's invented is something which there's a competition for. So somebody must decide, where is the gap? What do we lack? Let's run a competition for that. If there was a competition for innovation, for every new product created, well, you're limiting yourself quite, quite lowly. Remember that back in 1896, the person in charge of the US Patent Office recommended that the Patent Office be closed. Not 1996, 1896. His view was that in 1896, everything that can be invented has been invented. Compare what's been invented since then and what we now think could be invented over the next 100 years. <clears throat> so why government's incentives such as prizes could substitute for market incentives. History suggests it's only when market 
incentives were sufficient, that widespread innovation and growth took hold, that eventually the statute of monopolies developed, that it wasn't just from royal charter that you got your monopoly power, you could go in and claim it yourself. You could go in and say, I'm doing a new product, I'm claiming the monopoly right to this. So the Industrial Revolution, the beginning of sustained economic growth, occurred when the institutions protecting intellectual property were sufficiently well developed that entrepreneurs could capture as a private return some of the enormous social returns their innovations would create. If you had a new idea, you could go to the court, go to a patent office, get your patent, you could sell the product. You were the only one that could do so, and hence you could charge a price above marginal cost. So if it took time, it took effort, it took invention, you could capture that through the creation of a patent. So I'm going to leave it at that for today, and we'll take it up with different forms of patents on Thursday.